Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you and welcome to Iron Islam, the show where we look at current affairs through an Islamic lens. The 4th of August marks the Islamic Day for Human Rights and Human Dignity, inaugurated in 1990 by the Organization for Islamic Cooperation at the suggestion of the Islamic Republic of Iran. The day is designed to highlight the inherent dignity and value of human beings and outline the framework of human rights that the Quran and the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, set in stone. The Prophet Muhammad's mission was to establish Islam as more than just a religion. It was to bring about a divine, total way of life, and as part of that, the religion laid out the rights of humans in all spheres of life. In this week's episode, we'll explore what Islam has to say about the rights of men, women, Muslims, non-Muslims, bonded and freemen, and also contrast it with the universalist human rights model established by the liberal West. And what better way to begin than by exploring just a tiny fraction of what the Qur'an has to say about the rights of mankind. For Muslims, the Qur'an is a book of guidance which explains the fundamental beliefs of all Muslims. It also contains legislation by which Muslims must live their lives, as well as outlining the rights of various groups and individuals. To this end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the believers to uphold justice for mankind. In Surah Nisa, Allah says, O you who believe, be maintainers of justice, bearers of the witness of Allah's sake, though it may be against yourselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enjoined on Muslims to establish His law upon the earth to ensure real justice is established and man isn't oppressed by the greed and desires of other men. Allah also emphasizes on the most fundamental human right, the right to life. The importance and value of a human life is emphasized in Surah Al-Ma'idah, where Allah says, That is why we ordain for the children of Israel that whoever takes a life, unless as a punishment for murder or mischief in the land, it'll be as if they killed all of humanity. And whoever saves a life, it'll be as if they saved all of humanity. The Quran also allows for other beliefs, stressing that Christians and some Jews are people of the book, with God stressing in Surah Kaf that mankind has the free will with which he can choose to either believe or disbelieve, the consequences for which will be borne out on the Day of Judgment. And say, O Prophet, this is the truth from your Lord. Whoever wills, let them believe, and whoever wills, let them disbelieve. It will take too many hours to discuss all the different rights the Quran outlines, from the rights of women to inherit and to divorce, to the rights of the free men and the bonded. The overall theme is clear. God wants man to establish systems that protect his creation and their rights and gives clear guidelines for them to do so in the Qur'an. To discuss this important topic are two very special guests. We are honored to welcome Masood Shajare. Brother Masood is the chair of the Islamic Human Rights Commission, which has consultation status with the UN, and has been campaigning for human rights, concentrating on Islamophobia, the environment of hate, and justice for all. We are also honored to be joined by Sayyid Mohsen Abbas. Sayyid Mohsen is a TV producer, broadcaster, presenter, and journalist based here in the UK. Assalamu alaikum to you both, and thank you for uh, joining us. Sayyid, if I could just begin with yourself. Firstly, we heard as well there in that uh, clip there, uh, what does Allah exactly mean, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says in Surah An-Nisa, O you who believe, be maintainers of justice, bearers of the witness of Allah's sake, though it may be against yourselves. I think it, uh, it focuses on that word justice, and society can't function without justice. But justice is rooted in some very fundamental principles, values, uh, morality, ethics. What is that morality? What is that ethics? Well, in the modern day, we can see that there's moral relativism being thrown around. There's immorality and amorality uh, are strongly in the field, competing for, for the rule of uh, law, competing within society generally from a cultural, social, political basis. So what is, what is the, the, the fitri, uh, the, the natural, primordial, uh, and most fair and balanced uh, sense of justice in this world. Well, the Quran is very clear. It gives some uh, very clear guidelines. And I think, you know, they're based on wisdom 
a, a wisdom which is beyond human because it requires the beyond human uh, analysis of humanity itself and the, in order to create a balanced uh, sense of what justice really is. So I think Islam is the only faith, I think, who has, which has that, that complete, if you like, uh, uh, if you like, uh, if you like uh, holistic sense of what justice is. And I think it's for us to explore and to look at the, the principles, and it's the, there are jurisprudents who do it on a professional basis within the world of Islam, and they vary in their views, etc. But there is something called ijtihad, which is there constantly to refresh justice based on time uh, and, and place and circumstance and situation. This is something certainly within, within the Ahl al-Tashayyu that exists, which is a very powerful mechanism to ensure that justice is made relevant to yeah. every time and place. Absolutely. Yeah. Brother Masood, I don't know if you wanted to come in on that, that question as well. Yes, I, I think I think is. Um we're discussing something which is very vast, you know, the human right, justice, dignity. Um, the fact is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that uh, he has given dignity to man, nas, the human being, social being. And what Allah gives, no one could take it away. So no one has got the right of removing dignity from human beings, you know, because this is a God-given gift. And so within that, then there is the issue of Sharia and so forth. If somebody does wrong, how they will be treated and everything. But it starts from the basic principle that Allah has given dignity to mankind. And uh, then the concept of the justice, then Allah says in the Quran, how could you not rise and fight for sake of those oppressed men, women and children who are saying, Ya Allah, send us a protector. Now, you know, in the, in the concept of Gaza right now, you know, where is this uh, justice-seeking community that rises up to this? You look at the streets of London and so forth, you see them. They're Muslims, they're non-Muslims. And this call is not just to come and help Muslims, it's to help any oppressed. So Allah loves the oppressed people. You know, at, at one time, uh, at the time of Pharaoh, were the Bani Israel, yeah. and right now, uh, right now today, are people in Gaza. So, how do we do that? And I think basic principle of Quran, when it comes to the concept of justice and karama, dignity, is the Quran has come to stop the law of jungle. Mm. You know, a law of jungle that you don't have to live in jungle, you could live in West right now, but the law of jungle is actually what is being implemented. Look how uh, Netanyahu was uh, praised in United States mm. for doing what? Killing children, women, and so forth. So really what the United States uh, establishment is doing is closing the law of jungle, mm. is promoting the law of jungle. The Quran has come to stop that. And, and uh, so, really, the guidance in there, uh, the concept of justice, the concept of karama, is all comes together to stop mankind going towards that uh, destruction, which is the law of jungle and the arrogance of yeah. power. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's interesting because uh, Sayyid Masood there mentioned the West, for example, and there is a sense of lawlessness, really, in how world affairs, a so-called rules-based order, which doesn't really exist. But for the last, let's say, 200 years, if not more, the West has weaponized, in particular, women's rights uh, to then justify attacking the Muslim world or intervening. We've seen, actually, physical military interventions as well on this uh, pretext, if you will. You know, but what rights does the Quran actually afford women? Well, when the Quran is revealed, uh, it's on, in the backdrop of uh, what's the period of Jahiliyyah, in which they buried daughters alive. I mean, they buried them. This is the state of the situation when the Prophet arrives. Even in the, the, the Persian Sassanid Empire or within the Byzantine Empire, the rights of women were not at the level that we would expect uh, a really a civilized society have in the modern age. And the Prophet brings with, with him equality, but not the kind of equality we're talking about now. It's a, 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 a equity rather than equality. The term equality itself is a political tool, as you've kind of hinted. It's a political tool to really divide and to, to create tr trouble and problems. By telling somebody, oh, you're not equal, it can be equally uh, a method of being able to rile them up. So today we've got, um, we've got race wars, we've got gender wars, we've got 
you know, feminists moving in on uh, on these issues, the LGBT movement. All of this is, uh, to me, I mean, I don't have a problem with equality, and the Quran certainly doesn't have a problem with having people treated fairly and justly. But when you weaponize such things in a way where they become a means for the powerful, the already powerful, to divide the ordinary people in order to create further oppression and to uh, plunder even more. This is what the West is particularly doing these yeah. days and has, has done for many, many centuries now. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a lot of this has become a, a game. So women get used, uh, the, all the vulnerable minorities, they'll get used as a way of creating a division and atomizing society. Islam is not about atomization of society and just focusing on individualism. It's it's about the collective, it's about families, mm -hmm. it's about community, it's about bringing the world together. And the Ummah is not just uh, 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 the, for, for the Muslims. Ummah is regarded as being all humanity, but under the umbrella of a, a just uh, system, a system in which there can be a moral, genuine moral uh, guidance which, uh, which promotes mercy, compassion, love, mm -hmm. kindness, all of these values which we'd all relate to, no matter who we are, black, white, brown, whatever religion, but somehow, whilst uh, the West says it is doing that, the reality is very, very different. They discriminate, they plunder, they divide, they rule based on the lies and the use of narratives uh, which are all uh, very benign and uh, nice sounding, but uh, in reality they're tools I, for I control. I think the best example of that is the, um, the different value given to life. So you saw the difference in Ukraine, for example, where refugees were welcomed and you had news reporters and pundits and politicians literally using the words, oh, but these are civilized people. But then in Gaza, where even British citizens aren't given assistance by the consulate or the embassy there, uh, unless they were working with the intelligence services and they were told you can't leave unless you collaborate. So uh, there is even, even when it comes to the value of life, uh, those uh, differences there. Uh, now, another important source in the search for the rights of man is the Treaties of Rights or Risalat al-Hukuq, written by Imam Zain al-Abidin, the son of Imam Hussein. We take a look at some of those rights outlined in the short but powerful work. The West mistakenly touts the Magna Carta as the first charter of rights to ever be documented. But if you go back in history, there are other documents that predate the Magna Carta by 600 years, such as Risalat al-Hukuq, the treatise on rights authored by Zain al Abidin, the fourth Imam in the Jafari school of thought. It's a profoundly spiritual Islamic text that delineates some of the rights and responsibilities that individuals owe to God, themselves, their family, and society. Comprising over 50 rights, this treatise serves as a comprehensive ethical framework that underscores the importance of justice, compassion, and respect for all individuals. Today, the politicians of the world claim to adopt the UN Declaration of Human Rights, but it is a well-known fact that their hypocrisy and their application all over the world shows the ineffectiveness of man-made laws, where individualism reigns and the collective nature of humanity and nations are not accounted for. In the context of the modern world, where human rights are frequently violated, Imam Zain al Abidin's work remains remarkably pertinent. For instance, in Gaza, Palestine, the ongoing oppression illustrates the severe transgressions of basic human rights. The right to a family life, bodily security, and freedom from oppression, all emphasized in Risalat al Hurur, are continuously undermined by military aggression, blockades, and political instability. These inhumane conditions suffered by innocent civilians facing daily threats to their lives and dignity highlight the urgent need for a moral and ethical re-evaluation based on principles like those laid out by Imam Zain al-Abidin. Thus, Risalat al hurur offers timeless guidance that emphasizes the sanctity of human dignity and the importance of upholding justice to oneself and compassion. As it did 1400 years ago, today it still calls for reflection on and reformation of current practices to ensure that the fundamental rights of all individuals are respected and protected, urging a move towards a more equitable and humane world.
the Rasalat al Hukuk of Imam Zain al Abidin there. Brother Mas'ud, what is the position of the religion of Islam, especially when it comes to freedom of religion and the rights of religious minorities? Well, the, the contribution of Quran and the authentic documentation, the Hadith, and the, the work that has been done classically on right of um, communities, right of minorities, and so forth. It's so vast, it's really almost impossible for us to go into details. But if I say that, uh, you know, for example, um, right now in Iran, implementing some of those rights, uh, for example, the Christian community in Iran could use wine for the sermons, uh, the Catholics, uh, well, um, Wine and alcohol is like a drug in Iran. It's actually got the same sort of punishment as a drug. So it's almost like if in Britain, Rastafarians will be allowed to use hashish because they believe um, that this is part of their belief. So recognizing the legitimacy of minority religions to see their religion as they see it rather than enforcing their view, our views or majority views on them. This is extremely important. You see, the, the problem is that um, the, the concept of human right from an Islamic perspective is there in the classical work, is there in the Quran, but it has never been put together appropriately. Uh, there was an attempt by Cairo Decoration, and all they did, they took the uh, sort of UN charter um, they changed a couple of little poems. It's Islamatized it. They put Bismillah Rahman Rahim on top and Alhamdulillah on the bottom. And they said, this is Islamic. This is not it. The secular system has got an ideology concept that needs to be challenged. <clears throat> and when it comes to practice, mm. it actually does even worse. I mean, uh, all it does puts women against men blacks against white, white against black. So the colonial system could continue. The 1% will have all the power and everybody else is a slave to them. This is the reality. Now how we and, challenge it. Endless culture wars and so on. Absolutely, so, yeah. and, and you know, war and conflict, either internally or externally, is essential to continue conning the masses. Now, uh, Brother uh, Sayyid, it's uh, interesting, obviously, uh, Masood made mention there of the uh, Western frameworks, for example. Why does Islam take a different approach? Uh, you know, it seems to be that uh, it does protect religious minorities, it does protect the rights, but it also doesn't have a very laissez-faire approach, if you will, uh, in the same way maybe the West does. Well, I think there has to be balance. You know, wisdom, they say, is, the, uh, is uh, you know, understanding the, cr the true place of things, the maqam. Now, to understand the true place of things, you've got to have the ability to discern truth from falsehood. You've got to have an intrinsic morality in place. You've got to have a, a connection with wherever is the primordial source of humanity. And we say it's God, the divine. And, and you've got to have some system of being able to have humility. You see, and I think within the Western system, what fundamentally exists there, number one, there is an arrogance. Uh, that is at the heart of a lot of what being in, what's been involved, whether it's philosophically or inter systemically, politically or culturally. And that arrogance is based on, on a superiority cult. The superiority cult manifested itself in colonialism, mm -hmm. if you want to go just as far as back, or is, but it goes even further uh, back. But uh, colonialism followed by uh, sort of uh, imperialism and now neo-imperialism, if you like, uh, actually manifests that fundamental flaw. And that flaw is there deliberately, it's placed de deliberately by those who are the ruling elite, mm. by those who are in power, uh, because they want to maintain their power. They don't want education for the masses in the real way, the open critical thinking kind of education, the flood of the true freedom. They don't want people to have true equality or equity. They don't really want people to have uh, awareness of themselves. And now if you create a society where your education systems and your whole culture and your whole politics are based on a lie, uh, and then you do everything to herd people 
within that narrative, that lie, then what you're going to find is a completely disjointed, unbalanced society. Because the purpose of those imperialists and those ruling elites is not those things, not those uh, uh, you know altruistic things that we yeah. w- would would want. Uh, they want power and they want money and they want control. These are the three primary things, and they will do everything they can to get to get those. So values like. Uh, compassion, love, kindness, wisdom, knowledge, these things don't mean anything to them in reality. What they do is simply manipulate and use them as and how it will benefit them. Weaponize them against their enemies yeah. and so on and so forth. And uh, Brother Masood, I guess, you know, th- that does lead us to the question of how that balance is achieved, right? So, for example, um, you know, we see in the Western countries there's a claim for free speech, but certain topics are totally off are off limits and in many countries can even get you arrested for uh, speaking about them. Um, And yet when Islam very openly and clearly says there are some restrictions, for example, restrictions on blasphemy, uh, they seem to be attacked by it. But, you know, firstly, explain that hypocrisy and also what is that balance? How do we achieve it? Well, look, I think, as I said, you know, uh, in in practice, what West does is not what he philosophically preaches, you know. Um, we, we talked about the freedom of religion. We, I explained about what's happening in Iran regarding wine. Here in Britain, we've got the freedom of religion, mm. so-called, mm. Uh, freedom of uh, expression, freedom of uh, speech, but our masajids are not allowed to talk on politics. Mm. If they do, Charity Commission will put somebody in charge and stop them. Mm. Not because it's illegal, mm. but we can't do it. So something that is legal in the land but yeah. we Muslims cannot do it because we are Muslim. Yeah. Because we should not be able to empower ourselves and to speak out against Palestine. What we are seeing happening in the streets of London, Paris, uh, Germany, and, and New York, and so forth, is authorities are clamping down on people's right to express their solidarity with the Palestinian. And this is not minorities. 70, 80, 90 percent of the people, Mm. Muslim and non-Muslims, Jews, Christians, they all saying enough is enough. But these governments, against their own democratic values, are forcing a genocide and supporting genocide, financing genocide, and stopping us articulating support for the Palestinians. These are the reality. Don't go and read the sort of constitutions and what, what is being set out. You know, look at what is happening on the grassroots. What happened in, in uh, Hamburg the other day? Yeah. They sort of closed massages that have been going on for 50, 60 years. Mm-hmm. Why? Because accusation. This accusation did not come out of courts. Yeah. You know, they're saying that they're supporting terrorism. They're supporting this. If anybody is supporting terrorism, take him to court. Mm. Show the evidence and put them in jail. Why are you going for the bricks and, you know, building? I mean, what the bricks and building are doing? Why are you shutting them down? Because they don't want us to educate our future generation on true Islam. They want to actually promote American Islam, Mm. British Tashayyo. They want to interfere. Unlike Mm. we accept in places like Iran, the Christianity, as is understood by Christians, mm-hmm. here we are seeing a social engineering, a forced version of Islam being forced on the rest of us. And interestingly, you mentioned Iran just there quickly, not just religious, political as well. Christians and other minorities have specific seats in parliament re- designated for them as well. So just an interesting point as to how those Absolutely. rights are represented. Thank you so much, Brother Masoud and Said uh, Mohsen, for your time and enlightening us on this uh, topic. We'd also like to thank you at home for watching. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for this week, but you can join us again next week for another edition of Eye on Islam. Assalamu alaikum.